I ate enough ice cream in my childhood for 20 lifetimes. We had an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in our backyard. We had a freezers with all of the months, 31 flavors plus experimental flavors plus it was every kid's dream in a way. In that there was unlimited ice cream. I did eat ice cream for breakfast. It, it's true. It, it, was, it, was, it was really gross actually. <laughs> and, um, but there's a shadow side to all that. I uh, was born into the, uh, an ice cream company family, Baskin Robbins, 31 Flavors. My father and uncle founded the company, owned the company, ran the company. I'm an only son. I have sisters but no brothers, and my father groomed me to succeed him. It was his plan for my life that I would one day run Baskin Robbins, which was becoming and became during my childhood the world's largest ice cream company. It's a billion dollar company. And it was assumed that's what I would do. And I loved it. I mean, I grew up eating more ice cream. I, I don't eat ice cream anymore. And when people find that out, they sometimes look at me with a, as if they're feeling sorry for me, I think. And I say, please don't, please, really. I ate enough ice cream in my childhood for 20 lifetimes. We had an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in our backyard. We had a freezers with all of the months, 31 flavors plus experimental flavors plus it was every kid's dream in a way, in a way. In that, there was unlimited ice cream. I did eat ice cream for breakfast. It, it's true. It, it, was, it, was, it was really gross, actually. <laughs> and, um, but there's a shadow side to all that. Um, ice cream is really not a health food. It, it's not kale. <laughs> and uh, you can put some fruit in some of the sherbets and so forth. It's still basically very high in sugar. And, and most of the flavors are very high in fat, and the fat is highly saturated fat. It's not healthy. And so, people who eat a lot of it have health problems. My uncle, Bert Baskin, my dad's partner and brother-in-law, died of a heart attack at the age of 54. He was a very big man. He ate a lot of ice cream. And when he died, I asked my father, do you think there could be any connection between my uncle's fatal heart attack and the amount of ice cream he would eat. And my father looked at me and very piercingly said, no, no, no. His ticker just got tired and stopped working. And the expression on his face and the tone of voice said something else. It said, don't you ever ask that question again. Do you understand what I'm saying? John Bradshaw, the, the psychologist, uh, used to talk about there being no talk rules in families, taboo subjects that, that you just don't talk about in a given family, elephants in the living room that take up a lot of space, but no one mentions it. Because there's some kind of family dynamic at play in which there's not an ability to talk about that topic. In my family, one of the big elephants in the living room was that there could be a connection between ice cream and heart disease, or ice cream and health, or even food and health, that there might be a connection there. Because if you start down that slippery soap, food and health, you pretty soon get to ice cream and heart disease. And my father did not want to even consider the possibility that there might be a link, and I could understand why he would not want to. By that time, by the time of my uncle's death, which was in 1968, um, my father had manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who had ever lived on planet Earth. He didn't want to think the family product was hurting anybody, much less that it could have contributed to his partner, his brother-in-law, my uncle's death. But I felt I should. I felt I needed to consider, might there be that link? And um, the more I looked into it, the more I felt there was. And not just between ice cream and heart disease, but ice cream and diabetes. Um, my father developed diabetes, serious diabetes, later on. Um, uh, everybody in the family had these various issues, problems with weight everywhere. So I was faced with an existential quandary. On the one hand, a lot of financial security. On the other hand, my integrity. 
And I made a choice for integrity, and I told my dad that under the circumstances that I was not going to follow in his footsteps. I was not going to work any longer in the company. And what I specifically said to him was this. I said, Dad, we live in a different time now than when you grew up. We live under a nuclear shadow where at any moment the unspeakable could happen. We live in a time when the environment is deteriorating rapidly under the impact of human activities. We live in a time when the gap between the haves and the have-nots is increasing. And that does not, to my eyes, create social stability or security for anybody, even the wealthy and privileged. It's undermining the social fabric. Um, we live in a time when 60,000 people on Earth, many of them children, die of hu uh, hunger, die of starvation every day, while elsewhere there's abundant resources going to waste. And then I said to him, Dad, do you understand that for me, feeling these issues and concerns as intensely as I do, inventing a 30-second flavor would just not be an adequate response for my life. <laughs> and he understood to the extent that he could, um, but I needed to be, be true to myself. And so I made a choice for integrity and I walked away. And I also walked away from the money. To be in alignment with my integrity and my choices, I needed to have no access to and I told him that I didn't want a trust fund, I didn't want to depend in any way, not one dollar, on his fortune, his achievements. <laughs> and with Dale, my wife, we've been together 46 years now, we moved away and lived very simply, back to the land, built a log cabin, grew our own food, 95% of what we ate for 10 years we grew. 